those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Eric Strauss. I'm President's Professor of Biology here at Loyola Marymount University and the Founding Executive Director of the Center for Urban Resilience and have the great pleasure of working with Michelle on a daily basis. And I've known Charlie Nylon for a long time and, and I'll read the official one in a moment, but I, I just want you to pause for a moment and think about the fact that, that Professor Nylon was doing really cool work in urban ecology before urban ecology was cool. And one of the, for those of us, and I'm in my 60s, and, and when we got really excited about the notion of doing the work of wildlife biology in urban areas, because after all, that's where people live. Those are the ecosystems we have to get right. The density of wildlife in urban areas often exceeds that of its ruderial counterparts. But, but people were not willing to accept the idea that ecologists would, would not take an airplane ride to a remote location before they uh, started to do their science. And yet there's incredibly, it's, it's a little bit like, if you go back into the 90s, it was like Darwin visiting the Galapagos. We knew so little about cities. And Charlie Nyland is one of the great pioneers of doing this work, both as an ornithologist and vertebrate biologist and so forth. His official title, he's the William J. Rucker Professor of Fisheries and Wildlife at the University of Missouri. And it's within their School of Natural Resources. So his research is both theoretical and applied because the outcomes are expected that in natural resources. His research focuses on urban wildlife conservation and the human dimensions of wildlife conservation in cities. And as he's gonna to talk to you about, the human part is as complicated to get right as anything else. But what's really cool is for over 20 years, he was a co-principal investigator uh, of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, which is one of two long-term studies uh, funded by the National Science Foundation that really legitimized the fact that, that really good social, physical, and ecological science could be done in urban areas. And in fact, it was critical to do so. Um, and uh, since 2010, he's also been a principal investigator on four different so. synthesis projects that are compiling data on more than 150 of the world's cities. His projects seek to, seek to understand the global patterns of biodiversity in cities, the filters that shape species composition, and the social and ecological factors that shape patterns of abundance in cities. This is amazing theoretical work that when we look back on it historically, we'll say, wow, why didn't we start this 50 years earlier uh, so we could be on the road to getting cities right? So it is my, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Nylon today. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric, and, and thank you, Dr. Strauss and Dr. Uh, Romwe for inviting me, and it's exciting to be uh, with you all tonight. Uh, my sister-in-law taught at LMU in the late 90s for a couple of years. I've actually been on their campus. Uh, she taught over in the psychology department, and so it's fun to fun to uh, kind of at least be virtually with you. But tonight I'm gonna to talk really about a project I've been involved with in St. Louis over the last few years. And it kind of combines uh, the human dimension side as well as the wildlife side, kind of through a lens of environmental justice. And this deals with uh, a project that I got involved with, with with a colleague, Bob Pierce at our university as our extension specialist. And uh, looking at some neighbors in St. Louis that have had a long history of vacancy and, and a really interesting history that relates to environmental justice and how that relates to a particular actually green infrastructure program that promises to deliver both sort of uh, wildlife benefits as well as benefits for people and some of the responses to that. So I'll go ahead and I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then I'll talk about that. Okay, so uh, the project that uh, we got involved with is a project that the city of St. Louis calls the Urban Vitality and Ecology Project. And very, very briefly uh, to kind of set the scene for this. So uh, St. Louis, as you obviously know, is on the Mississippi River, which is on the right but St. Louis City is a very, very small part geographically and actually population-wise of, of the St. Louis metro area. So the city of St. Louis was 800,000 people in 1954. 
and it's just over 300,000 people now. And so what's happened is there's been a big flight of residents and capital and infrastructure out of the city into uh, surrounding St. Louis County. So actually uh, for uh, folks who are familiar with Baltimore, Baltimore and St. Louis have a lot of parallels in their history, how they developed some of the patterns of the city. But the project that we got involved with is one that the city of St. Louis has called Urban Vitality and Ecology Project, which promises to uh, benefit residents of the city by focusing on urban biodiversity and ecosystem services, and particularly focus on things like health. And they look think of health as being contact with nature and exercise. And this is very much focused on vacant land in the city, particularly vacant lots. So this is the flyer uh, that the city uses for this program. And they have goats, which I've referred to the urban gardens. They talk about being able to access the river. A lot of things that the city is interested in doing. Now, the particular subset of that that I've been involved with is a project called the Green City Coalition. And the Green Kit City Coalition is an effort by really two City of St. Louis organizations and then several other organizations. Um, but the SLDC, which has a nice gateway arch on it, it's St. Louis Development Corporation. They're the city agency charged with managing vacant land. So they do a vacant loss with abandoned homes and so on. And then Project Clear is part of the Metropolitan Sewer District of St. Louis, of St. Louis. And the Metropolitan Sewer District works in St. Louis City and City in St. Louis City and St. Louis County to deal with stormwater management. And St. Louis city and county have been under an EPA sanction for several years now as a result of a lawsuit over uh, non-point source, non source pollution into the Missouri Mississippi River. And so as part of that, MSD has been working with St. Louis Development Corporation to look at green uh, infrastructure projects on vacant lands that they can use to impact stormwater uh, management and uh, also to provide opportunities for different kinds of recreation. The logo on the left is Missouri Department of Conservation, which is the State Conservation Agency, the Wild and Forestry Committee's um, agency. So they're all involved in this effort to really look at vacant lands and how they can manage those for a variety of green infrastructure benefits. And uh, so the project we're focusing on deals with that. Now, um, if you think about vacant lots, and sort of their benefits. You can think of vacant lots of places for their wildlife, for wildlife and wildlife habitat. There's potential for people to benefit psychologically from it, from exercise. Um, there are places where they, they can create spaces for people that are safe, for community resilience, for food gardens, all those kinds of things. But there are also these negative aspects. Now, I stole the graphic on the right, comes from the Tulane University Urban Rat Project, which is a big National Science Foundation project they had. This is their logo that's on their website. But uh, vacant lots also have negative aspects. They're sites where you can have disease exposure. For example, a whole range of disease vectors from mosquitoes to ticks to fleas, to all kinds of things which potential disease and health impacts. Uh, they're often sites of crime, particularly of uh, crimes that are particularly a nuisance crime in neighborhoods like people drinking, using drugs, those kinds of things. They're often viewed as a symbol of neighborhood decline and the restoration is often viewed as a step toward gentrification. So our study that we're working on takes place in St. Louis in an area called North St. Louis. And North St. Louis is now the African-American uh, neighborhood in St. Louis. It's been predominantly black neighborhood since the 1950s and 1960s. And um, so our project, we're interested in trying to understand these lots and their management in terms of the sort of broader history of North City, and also in terms of a concept called everyday nature that we'll talk about a little bit later. And we're looking at birds and bird habitat as sort of a window for looking at conservation in neighborhoods in North City. And also we're looking at these places as sort of a lens to look at how people actually perceive their neighborhood and vacant lands. Now, North St. Louis, uh, again, is a slide says for about the last 60 years has really been the sort of um, poster child for all the things that go wrong in big cities in the United States. They've had a significant population decline. They've uh, had all kinds of things happening. They have high crime. They have uh, poor schools. They have very little infrastructure and so on. But they also are places that have significant um, 
green spaces, they have large parks, a lot of things. So we were interested in trying to understand what's happened in North St. Louis and how this is relevant to bird conservation and to people. And so we're gonna do this through a couple different lenses. I've already mentioned this idea of everyday nature, but we're also going to look at this through a couple other lenses. One is through environmental justice, and uh, which basically deals with the concept of there's an unequal distribution of the cost and benefits associated with the environment, which could be due to race or gender, poverty status, and so on. It tends to be systemic. In other words, that there's a system that maintains environmental justice um, or in environmental injustices. And often the people on the right, such as Beverly Wright at Delaware University and uh, other faculty at other universities, uh, work on trying to understand the mechanism of this. So Nick Heinlein on the bottom, for example, is very interested in the mechanisms that, that set up environmental justice. And finally, there's always an activist and scholarly tradition. So probably in Los Angeles, in most cities, there's a strong sort of grassroots environmental justice work, but there's also a research tradition and so on. And we're going to use that sort of some of the theories out of that to try to look at what's happening in St. Louis. And uh, for some references, which I forgot to um, send in for you, um, there's a really good book and also uh, online sort of lecture version of, of this book called Mapping Decline, which is uh, written by a guy named Colin Gordon at the University of Iowa, but it's about St. Louis and really about uh, sort of a very GIS focused almost look at uh, how cities decline and change over time and the role of green infrastructure and so on. And then uh, the three folks I, I referenced on the right are people who do a lot of work in St. Louis. Keon Irvin is professor at University of Missouri in Columbia where I am. Andrew Hurley is at University of Missouri St. Louis and Gary Kramer is a uh, director of the State Historical Society of Missouri where all of them have done a lot looking at what's happened in St. Louis particularly with the black community in St. Louis. So the whole focus of what's happening in North City, you need to think about through the lens of um, restricted for black people to live in the city. And this really happened around the time of World War I. And uh, around the time of World War I, there was a big influx of black residents into St. Louis. And it's happened in several cities throughout Midwestern United States, there was a lot of conflict and tension around that. There were riots. East St. Louis had a very had a very major race riot right across the Mississippi River from St. Louis in Illinois. And so there's a lot of tension around this. And this map shows uh, a 1934 look at the city of St. Louis and the dots represent where there were black residents. So you see that in 1934, um, Black residents were concentrated in pretty much the center of the city and the perspective on this map is a little bit weird because you're looking from east to west. So east is on the bottom. So that's sort of east and uh, central part of the city where the black uh, community was. And you notice that the large uh, areas that are kind of boxed out are parks and other green spaces. So most of the large parks kind of more of the green amenity kinds of things were not where the black community was. Now, what led to, <coughs> excuse me, that map were a series of, of, of steps that were taken to enforce where Black people could live. And this involved efforts by government, by the private sector, uh, by a whole range of commercial uh, and civic groups in St. Louis, and also by some federal government policy. So between the 1917 and 1940, there were a number of activities that sort of set up the pattern you're seeing in the previous graphic. First, in 1917, the city of St. Louis uh, proposed and passed a referendum to legally enforce segregation, which said that, that residents could not buy property in a neighborhood that was, black residents could not buy property in a neighborhood that was more than 75% black. And white residents could not buy property in a neighbor. I said that back because you get the idea. You couldn't buy property in uh, neighborhoods that were not of the race you were. And uh, that lasted for about a year. In 1918, that was overturned by the Supreme Court. And then this led to a whole range of other, other factors. But um, the things that's really important to think about in here are the process of restrictive covenants, which are tied actually to the title deeds of property. Uh, redlining, which relates to actually a federal um, loan program, 
called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, Urban Renewal and Public Housing, were all part of this process of sort of shaping where people lived, and restricting where people lived in the city. Then in the 1950s, uh, as this began to become undone, things like public housing uh, changed where people lived in the city. It led to white flight from St. Louis City to St. Louis County. Um, gradually that developed as St. Louis became more of a black city. Many black residents also left for St. Louis County and this led to this process of sort of economic decline, which has really shaped what's happening in the North City. So- Billy, can I interrupt you for one second? It looks like we have a question. Amelia, sure, did certainly. you? Sorry, um, last semester I had a first year seminar about Black Los Angeles. And yes. I remember reading like a, a text about, um, I'm not sure what date it was. Um, I guess it was around the same time, maybe like the 1950s, something like that, where they were talking about this, like the, the separation of the segregation in like different neighborhoods and that there yeah. were certain black kids who were, because they were, they were removing these restrictions and then some, some African-American children were being able to go to schools in white, white districts. Right. And then they talked about these like um, youth, like white gangs, which were like the, they were kind of like a youth KKK thing. It was weird. And I think it, I don't remember what they were called. Um, and it talked about just like the general kind of them like patrolling like the entire neighborhood, trying to like scare off like the, the kind of incoming flux of um, other uh, African-American like uh, communities that were coming into like the supposed white neighborhoods. I don't know if that um, has any relevance to what you were mentioning about the whole like redlining thing. Yeah, I think it does. Well, let me, let me answer this. So redlining actually was, was, and I didn't use the map in this, in this presentation, but redlining was officially, uh, uh, well, the actual process was something called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which actually was part of the New Deal legislation. And the idea behind redlining was to basically provide people access to loans, to uh, buy houses, to take out loans, approved property, that kind of thing. And what, uh, and why it's called redlining was actually that each city that used this program, uh, they, they appraised property and they typically used colors to appraise the property. So typically the red areas and red were the ones which were the least desirable from a loan standpoint. So I think what you hear about the redlining a lot in terms of setting up patterns in cities is because uh, in many cities, the poorest areas uh, where they're the least desirable places in terms of if you're trying to give out loans, uh, tend to be the places that had, had say large African-American population, more segregated and so on. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind about, about Missouri as a state is Missouri's kind of a strange state because it was in the union, but it has slavery. So Missouri had uh, segregation very much, uh, much like the pattern of many Southern states that had segregated schools. For example, Missouri schools were not integrated until 1954. And there's some interesting things that Missouri, Missouri is one of the few states that actually mandated school segregation by law. So it was illegal for white students to go to black schools and illegal for black students to go to white schools. So there's some really interesting things in Missouri that way, but but so some of what you're seeing in here ties into the overall pattern, but I, I don't know as much about the sort of gang kinds of things, uh, but I know that early on there was a lot of tension. Um, there were riots in the early 60s and I think some of the 50s as well, but I'm not as familiar with that, with that side of it. Um, but what you're getting at may tie in with what we're going to talk about next, which kind of starts now talking about vacant lands. And um, so this is a map out of actually a, a picture out of Gordon's book and of his website. What they're showing is uh, some data about uh, showing how sort of the whole property aspect of this worked. And so now we're talking about a family that bought a house on Wells Avenue which is in sort of northwest part of St. Louis City in uh, 1940. And they moved into census tract 6F in uh, St. Louis City. And it says St. Louis City County because St. Louis City is a county in Missouri, which is kind of weird because there's also St. Louis County, which is also a county. But, um, so St. Louis City, they bought this uh, house in 1940. And at the time they bought the house, that census tract that contained uh, 
the lot had 8,500 residents and there were 27 black residents. In 1960, uh, the family sold the house on, uh, on Wells and they moved to 5339 Geraldine, which I believe is in St. Louis County, because I think I-70 is more or less the city county line in that, that part of the city. So they bought a house. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, they bought a house uh, maybe a couple miles north out in the county. And at the time they moved out, uh, the, popu the population of that census tract had declined by about 1,000 individuals and 87% were Black. So what was happening was that between the 1940s and the 1960s, there was a major shift in where people lived that was primarily due to urban renewal and was tore down a lot of housing in the city. And also public housing was displaced a lot of uh, Black residents. So both Black residents and white residents were starting to move around. So what's important to think about is, is that when we start talking about the neighborhoods, that a lot of the neighborhoods, the people living in them uh, who live there now would be the children or grandchildren of people who bought property there in uh, the 1960s. So you start looking at these neighborhoods and you're seeing already that the population is starting to decline. You're starting to see people starting to move out of uh, North City. So this is an area in North City, which was white through the 1950s, has now become predominantly black. Okay, so our study setting with that background, we're gonna look at two Green City Coalition neighborhoods, Wells Goodfellow and Baden. And uh, these are two areas which are designated names by uh, the city for neighborhoods. And Baden, actually, people call Baden. Wells Goodfellow, they don't call Wells Goodfellow, but that doesn't matter unless you're from St. Louis. So on the left, we see, uh, well, we see Baden. On the right, we see Wells Goodfellow. And the only thing to really think about in here is these are maps which show vacant land or vacant lots in St. Louis. So these are lots where houses have been torn down. And uh, the really large spaces often are businesses or industry, but the, the sort of smaller spots are almost all residential housing. So what you're seeing and the colors just represent what those lots, what the land cover is. But if you look at all those different colors, other than what are trees, those are vacant lots. So this shows two neighborhoods in St. Louis have a high amount of vacancy. And these are neighborhoods that the Green City Coalition is targeting for their program to try to address stormwater runoff uh, by putting in green infrastructure projects of a variety of types in neighborhoods with the idea of providing, of providing more biodiverse neighborhoods, access to uh, green access to community gardens, to nice place to visit and so on throughout these neighborhoods. And to give you a little idea again of what we just showed, uh, Sebastian Moreno, who we'll talk about in a second, one of my grad, was one of my graduate students. And so for example, he mapped vacant lot polygons and in Wells Goodfellow, there were 667, making up 203 acres. So 203 acres of that neighborhood were vacant. Uh, and it just shows the different cover types that were there. And so you notice that some of these areas become wetlands because they basically flooded uh, from a variety of factors, basically from, from, uh, from having a lot of impervious surface and runoff. Uh, but most of these are either uh, covered by just lawn or in some cases they've grown up in woodlands. Now, the plan to address this is a plan that's been developed, developed by Green City Coalition. And this is a, a architect's rendering of one of the spaces. This is one of the larger spaces in the Sun Wells Goodfellow. And what you're seeing is in the background is actually a city park. Behind the, um, in the foreground is um, one of the lots. So the plan is they're trying to link a lot of these lots in with existing green space in the city to make these more attractive. And so you see in here that they're showing sort of all the possible things. There's a community garden, there's an amphitheater, there are all these things going on. And none of these really would include all of these and all of these things they're trying to show what features would be there. And uh, this project was really, really disliked by the residents. And so part of our project, the research we were doing was to understand the human dimension side, why people might be opposed to a project that promises green benefits for them. And then also to try to understand 
uh, by using what the birds and bird habitat, what these neighborhoods are like right now. So we're gonna move next to kind of the second framework we're trying to look at with everyday nature. And this is some work, uh, this is called day-to-day -day nature. Uh, it comes actually out of environmental psychology and Rachel and Stephen Kaplan, who were professors at the University of Michigan in the 19, um, 60s, 70s, and 80s did a lot of this work. And basically their work talks about the importance that the places that are important to people, the kind of nature that's important are the places within a mile of where you live or work. So they talk about these are places uh, often where people have the strongest views about what they like and dislike. They're the places people see every day. It's where they're familiar with the kind of nature where they see animals and plants and all those things which uh, are part of nature in urban settings. And they're also the places that are most relevant to management because that's what people know the most about and are most engaged. So, and the idea about everyday nature is that they're bottom up processes that's, that shape this. And that's tied to people who live in the neighborhood, their, their sort of ability to manage it, uh, to sort of make decisions about it, what they perceive as the sort of emotional views about it. And also the fact that there's a legacy of what was there before. So that, Legacy is really important here in that that legacy represents uh, these neighborhoods which have changed a lot over the last 50, 60 years, uh, the increased amount of vacancy because of vacant lots, abandoned houses, and so on. Then the top down processes are things that government does. So those things like planning, zoning, redlining, all these other things which uh, are part of a sort of more government or um, the sort of city leader type of, uh, of decision-making. Okay, and then again, the first part of our study then was to try to understand these neighborhoods as places uh, and kind of looking at sort of what kinds of places these are from a wildlife perspective based on bird, looking at birds and bird habitat uh, in these two neighborhoods. So Sebastian Moreno, who is on the right in the picture, who, uh, Got his master's at MU and now is a PhD student at UMass in uh, Amherst and working with Paige Warren, who your instructors know. Um, he did bird counts in these neighborhoods in 2017 and 2018, where he had 100 meter strip transects. He walked along city streets and he counted birds within 50 meters of, the, of those transects. Uh, the, these one hectare areas where he did his bird counts were selected based on the percentage of vacant land in each of the neighborhoods. So in other words, we sampled to reflect uh, what exists in the neighborhood based on the pattern of vacant land. So, so we had some uh, transects where there was no vacant land. We had some where it was 100% vacant land, but the idea was to capture what people in the neighborhood are experiencing in terms of seeing birds and bird habitats. And we also measured habitat features within this uh, one hectare area that bordered the, uh, the transit route kind of the birds. So what Sebastian found were there were 53 species of birds that he found, and uh, which is probably about what you would expect, for example, in Baltimore, uh, in our counts and in Baltimore neighborhoods, we found now around 90 species of birds. So and when you figure that we're looking at a much wider range of places in Baltimore, this is probably pretty typical of what you'd expect for two sort of urban neighbors, neighborhoods. Uh, the common species are sort of the things you expect to see uh, in the more, more, more dense and more built up urban neighborhoods. So starlings, robins, common grackles, northern cardinals and chimney swifts. And I realize you're all in California. So if you're in the Midwest and Eastern part of the United States, this would be a pretty common group of birds to see in residential neighborhoods. Uh, the less common species that are probably tied more to the vacant lots or things like dick thistles, which are like a grassland bird, uh, you see often in prairies in the Midwest, red-winged blackbirds, cedar waxwings, northern flickers. So these are ones which are less common and again probably tied to the lots. Uh, we looked at some of the characteristics of what of the sort of the habitat features of, of the neighborhood, and we see a couple things. Um, first, the things at the top parts of the last two really relate to, um, to sort of ground cover characteristics, things like um, 
you know, what covers, covers the ground of these neighborhoods. So there's a lot of artificial surface, there's a lot of lawn. And then the two items at the bottom are uh, tree cover and shrub cover. And so you see, again, there's not a lot of tree canopy cover, the shrub canopy cover in these neighborhoods. A lot of this is because um, just older urban neighborhoods, there hasn't been as much tree, tree replanting in some of these neighborhoods. Um, so that kind of reflects, reflects that. I'm sorry. Okay, so in general, as we think about sort of the lens of what people, people are seeing, you could think about that the areas which clearly have things like robins and cardinals are the residential neighborhoods that have more trees and shrubs. Um, they're typically more residential lots. And then they have the vacant lots that often are older where they're grown up, they're shrubbier and brushier and so on. The uh, residential areas, again, that tend to have more things like chimney swifts and starlings tend to be some of the neighborhoods which, or the areas in the neighborhoods which have uh, probably more abandoned housing uh, often or just more dense housing with less vegetation. And then uh, the places that were mostly vacant are again where we're seeing things like dick thistles uh, and some of these larger areas where there's a lot of grass cover. Uh, some of the areas that are more wet have red winged blackbirds and so on. So those kinds of places are, are sort of what we're seeing uh, across the neighborhoods. Now, how this fits in with the rest of our project uh, is trying to understand how people were, in, were interpreting the plans for green infrastructure stormwater management. And so we're interested in how they perceive the plans and how that related to how they viewed uh, things like vegetation, wildlife habitat, and so on. Again, using that same kind of lens of what people were seeing. One reason we did that was because we felt from talking with people that it was really that it was really difficult to get people talking about the plan itself because um, again, the plan itself is a big plan. They talk about all this, all these things. They've met with residents a lot, but we didn't. But uh, we felt that we were trying to get more at what people wanted to see or did not want to see, and less about the details of what were in the plans. So. We're looking again with this, the, the final sort of framework we're looking at, it comes more out of human dimension, something called popular values of nature. And uh, we're seeing a few people on here who've been involved with this, the people on top, Jacqueline Burgess and Carolyn Harrison were in England in uh, the 80s and 90s and did a lot of work on this. And uh, folks on the bottom, Emily Muratet and Teddy Reef work in France. But the idea of popular values of nature essentially are that uh, managers, biologists, architects, planners tend to have what they would call elite values in the sense of their values based on their education and training versus popular values that residents might hold. And these popular values typically focus on things like people enjoy day-to-day -day content of nature and they're not necessarily focusing in on rare species, rare plants, conservation topics, they enjoy the content of nature. Uh, they recognize that nature is social and the interaction with nature often has a social aspect to it, which involves people and their families and their kids and how they interact. And we also, and also recognizing that these popular values often focus on the kind of darker aspects of contact with nature around people's risk, fears, concerns about safety and so on. So that's sort of the framework, how we decided to try to look at this, um, at some of this as well. So we're thinking about environmental justice. We're thinking about this sort of um, nearby nature and about popular values of nature. So uh, Drew Malinak, who um, is uh, the grad student working on this, who now works for a consulting firm, does human dimensions work, uh, did this for his master's. And in this case, he did uh, semi-structured interviews with residents of uh, Baden and Wells Goodfellow, 27 residents, to look at their perception of vacant lots. He also looked at their photo evaluation to get a preference for lot habitats their views about wildlife and wildlife habitat, and their views on management. So we had information of what kinds of species and habitats were there. And so Drew's almost sort of looking at what people are saying about those spaces. So not just the lots, but also the neighborhoods and so on. So um, Drew did, uh, again, qualitative research. So I'm gonna talk about the themes which he found. So his sort of 
findings were with it first, that people's preference for the lots and how they're managed really is tied to what they see on the lots. So things like wildlife, vegetation, their views about the lots really are shaping their preferences for management. And what really is driving that are views about community change. That is how the neighborhoods have changed over time. Safety, uh, neighborhood care, and this means sort of how people feel the neighborhood is being viewed, cared for, the role of residents, those kinds of things. And then finally, the maintenance effort. And I'm gonna talk really just about two of these community changes in safety and how this connects with uh, management preferences. So the number one thing I think to understand that probably ties together environmental justice, nearby nature, and this idea of uh, popular values would be to understand, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that the people who live in Wells Goodfellow right now, this is Wells Goodfellow on the left, um, live in a neighborhood uh, which looks like it does in the picture, it has a lot of vacant land, a lot of abandoned buildings, a lot of half torn down buildings, buildings like the one on the bottom where you can see the houses are kind of stuck in the midst of uh, uh, abandoned buildings with trees growing through the roof, those kinds of things. So, but this was a neighborhood which say 60 years ago was very vibrant, uh, had busy commercial district, uh, lots of stores, schools were open, lots of resources and so on, and it was a, and it was a black neighborhood. So many of the residents on uh, the neighborhood talked a lot about this idea of change. And what they said over and over was, you know, I grew up here in the 60s and 70s, and it was a wonderful place to grow. Everybody, you know, all, every, I, there were families here, lots of families, lots of kids. I moved away, a lot of people moved away to other places in the St. Louis area. They said, you know, my mom died. She, I didn't want the house to be sold, so I moved back in. And now I'm in this neighborhood where it um, looks like this. And so that's what a lot of people felt. And they saw this idea of change in the lens of loss and abandonment. They feel like there's a loss to them personally, and they've been abandoned by the city who really doesn't see any alternatives except saying we're going to make these places green. And that came up a lot in the discussion. So a lot of people mentioned that they view vegetation and wildlife on the vacant lots not as being a benefit, but being essentially a sign of this neglect. So people say, you know, the vegetation looks trashy, it's everything's overgrown and weedy. Um, and all the wildlife we see are things like raccoons coming out of the vacant houses. And what we want to see is the city to address that before they do anything around trying to create green infrastructure. Um, when we talked about issues around safety, uh, again, this is, um, we could think about safety in terms of crime, but people talked about safety in a very wide range of ways. They talked about safety in terms of interaction with the police, uh, particularly around the idea that the police, the city, city of St. Louis Police Department is not very responsive to the residents' concerns about the crime they actually face. And what most people face with the vacant lots are not so much violent crime, but things like people hanging out in lots and drinking, drug use in the, in the lots, prostitution, things which often are viewed by the city as not really being a serious crime, but are a big issue to uh, the residents. So, so they felt that the city just wasn't responding to them. The other aspect of, the, of, the, of, the, of safety, again, deals with this idea of the lots as maybe being places that might be risky places to visit. We talked about kind of the perception of crime going on, but also people talked about you can't see through the lots because it's weedy, so you can't, you don't really want to go in there. Uh, they talked about the lots looking overgrown. They talked about not looking safe. And a lot of the wildlife there, again, was viewed as something that maybe doesn't belong. So people said, yeah, we know there are coyotes in St. Louis. We don't want to see them here. Uh, people said we see deer sometimes, you know, deer are great in the city, but not here. So this idea of sort of animals, particularly a lot of mammals is not really being safe in that or being safe in terms of maybe a threat to the neighborhood or threat to people, but probably also just not really belonging. So all of that was tied up in this idea of safety. So the general concerns that Drew found were this idea of the city giving up, the idea that the plans put in place, for example, um, ideas for pocket prairies look a lot 
to people like an overgrown weedy lot. So the plans that, this, that the conservation department talked about creating wildlife habitat of many prairies, many prairies might not be the ideal thing. Here's about gentrification. The bottom uh, picture, for example, a lot of people said, oh, you know, if um, they do this, it'll be a nice neighborhood. People won't, we won't be able to afford housing here and so on. So what we were finding were these mixed reactions to uh, the Green City Coalition, Coalition intervention. And what people said they preferred were a place for community gardening, for gatherings, for recreation, where they could see the common species they liked, like robins and cardinals. So they liked wooded, well-maintained lots that were open that you could see. So places that look like this, maybe not quite a, with a little better grass and things for nymphs like this. They talked a lot about wanting places like West County, which is predominantly white area, St. Louis and very wealthy, but basically places that they viewed as enhancing the neighborhood and being useful. So our conclusions, and I have the One Health slide on here because this was also tied in with ideas about climate change and health and so on. Um, the idea of saying that environmental justice nearby nature and the sort of popular values of nature, all are ways of kind of framing this issue that um, basically the justice issues here are this legacy of change in North City and that definitely drives how people view conservation efforts. They view the injustice of what's happened in North City and, and how that shapes their views of the Green City Coalition plans. Um, the ideas about what people want to see, the kind of popular budget, what they want to see, and the context in which they view and receive are also important. So basically, the take-home messages that we gave uh, as part of this project were first, that a lot of people's views are very lot and location specific. In other words, people, people care about what's next to their house and about the size of what's going on in their neighborhood. Uh, the perceptions and sort of negative perception, negative realities aren't really changed by restoration and management. In other words, people don't say, wow, I love my neighborhood now because it's being restored. And then um, also people value vegetation and wildlife for some species, and they do not value that for other species. So they're definitely it's kind of context specific. And then finally, the people do recognize the benefits of these programs they talked about, you know, nature and health. They talk about liking the exercise. They talk about liking seeing wildlife. But all this is tied in again with this, with this uh, more complex framework. So what I'd like to do and leave time for questions for everybody is uh, first acknowledge just the people that were involved. The Green City Coalition uh, has, were really the people who were really supportive of the work and have really been supportive of our research and helped my students out and were really receptive to a lot of the ideas we had, and um, then the grad students and then my colleagues. And finally, our project was funded through a National Science Foundation program called Missouri EPSCOR. So with that, thank you for your time. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. That was that was really interesting and, and touched on a lot of what I've been, um, we've been talking about in class, which I, I feel, you know, like you all have, you saw some photos of um, the Kaplans that we've talked about them quite a bit um, and vacant lots. And um, it really tied together a lot of the concepts that we've, we've covered in, in the beginning of our class. Um, and then we also have folks from, from outside of LMU and outside of my class. So um, yeah, let's open it up to questions. So Charlie, I have a question for you. <laughs> I'll kick it off. Okay. So when we think, when we, we we sort of moved into this space of working, whether I you know, I was working in Boston, a bunch of folks from Baltimore as you were, mm -hmm. and then you work in St. Louis. By the way, I was born in in Florissant, so I know know the area. Okay, um, you're right up by there. Yeah, you're right. Up yeah, by there. you know. So we went into this thinking that this trans, this green transformation, would be welcome with open arms, and mm -hmm. and and we and so we use this model of ecosystem services and and thinking that that would be our metric, and and you know you finished with the notion of one health and all these other um, all these other elements, and I'm wondering if you might comment on your on your perspective now over this arc of 20 years and whether you think that 
these communities are still malleable and maybe there over time there are other visions of green that can be introduced? Okay. That's a great, a great question. And, and I'll say that kind of in the interest of time, I kind of left out part of this. Um, if you go well over to Missouri River, or Mississippi River, if you go sort of east, maybe five or six miles, I think that they had a very different story. Um, and the Riverfront Trail, which goes from the Arch all the way up to Tanner Rocks Bridge, and you can go across into Illinois and all over the place now. But, but that was a project that started probably, and I think I talked about this actually in Boston, but the Riverfront Trail project started um, in the mid 90s. And uh, the idea is to build a trail uh, along essentially the Mississippi River, the levee uh, and the flood wall, which means send to Eric, probably nobody else, but um, this is the area along the Mississippi River that's in St. Louis City. And um, the groups that really were pushing that were a group called Grace Hill Settlement House, which is a sort of social service group in St. Louis. And then actually a lot of the aldermen in North City. So all the neighbors were sort of along the river. And that project, I think, had a lot of support. Uh, we also did some bird stuff with that. And this would be uh, in part because it really focused on places that were more sort of public spaces like um, well, Fallon Park, which is one of the city, big city parks, uh, Bell Fountain Cemetery, Calvary Cemetery, and then uh, went a little bit to North Riverfront Park, and then a um, um, few other areas in there, and, and also a lot of just the green space and industrial areas along there. So, so about where the jail is, or what's called St. Louis, the workhouse, which is an interesting name, but anyway, uh, workhouse and uh, for Procter and Gamble and all these places. So there's a lot of green space in there. And that really the neighbors got behind, I think in part because they're places that people had access to. But the other thing was, I think that um, Grace Hill Settlement House had a very different kind of history in the neighborhood that people know them, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization that started like in 1905 and they've worked with residents in those neighborhoods from the time it was an immigrant neighborhood, predominantly German in the 1905 to now. And so there are a lot of trust in there. Um, I think also they really work to identify things that I think people were interested in, like they talk about access to the river, which um, it's pretty hard to do uh, because of highways and rivers and all this. They, they worked on getting access to the river on a lot of opportunities for recreation along the river, you know, hiking, biking, bird watching, all that. So there was a lot of support. And one of my colleagues did a survey of people on the Riverfront Trail and their activities. And they found that a lot of people from North City neighborhoods used it. People fish from, you know, people go fishing along the river from there. They went birding. Um, they went rabbit hunting, which is apparently illegal because they're using guns, which aren't supposed to do in the city. But we saw people rabbit hunting, all kinds of things. But if you go to this other neighborhood, I think part of this was, was that I think in, in Wells Goodfellow, people were really kind of fed up with the city, for lack of a better term. I think there was just a lot of just mistrust with the city. And I think St. Louis City and St. Louis County, I guess I think living outside of there, but I, I think that like a lot of cities, politics are really, really, there's a lot going on. And I think especially right now, there's a lot going on in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. And there's a lot of stuff, particularly involving the police and, and um, involving St. Louis Development Corporation. There was a lot of just issues going on. And then the other thing I think was, was that I think the scale issue was really a big deal because a lot of the projects, if you go now on the Green City Coalition website, they'll talk about a place called Peace Park and they talk about the loop, um, something. Hold on, so hold on my, hold on my trail. So hold on my streetcar, which used to be a streetcar line ends and ends in uh, basically by Wells Goodfellow. And there's a liquor store there called the Belt Loop Liquor, which is right by where the streetcar used to turn around. And they did a project there that kind of involved the liquor store where they did a whole thing about history of the neighbor neighborhood, a little pocket park, and people love it. You know, and Peace Park is one of the same thing. So these really small scale projects, people think are great. I think the larger projects, I think the things just look more like, um, I think there's just more mistrust of those. And a couple other neighborhoods where they've had maybe smaller scale projects like Walnut Park, which is another neighborhood that's kind of um, in that same area. They said they've had, supposedly had very good interaction with them. But again, I think it's more of the scale and just kind of the 
the um, I think it's the interaction and maybe the fact that the neighborhood feels involved and they've done Green State Quills has, has met a lot of a lot of public meetings, but I think they just didn't quite connect with people. Mm -hmm. I'm rambling, so I'll stop and let me let you uh, so I'll answer the question, I'm sorry. Well, I'll ask a question of you all. Do you, so are most of you from Los Angeles from that, from that area from California? No, okay. Uh, so for those of you from there, is this is this story kind of relevant to what you're hearing in like LA or other places or is it is it pretty different? Um, yeah, it was reminding me a lot of just in one of my other classes that I'm taking right now, we've been talking about like gentrification that can be caused as a result of like adding more green spaces and like if you're not very careful or if certain measures aren't taken to like prevent um displacement then like greening a space could just cause this like rippling effect of displacement of the people who currently live there so it was definitely just kind of reminding me of that just kind of discussion well, and I think what's interesting and in, in what gentrification in St. Louis is, is that um, so what people talked a lot, at least, well, so Wells Good from Baden are pretty, they're, they're kind of different neighborhoods and that Baden is a little more stable. Um, I think the red has higher income, it's a different, little different neighborhood, but uh, Wells Good for what a lot of people talked about. So, so they talked about uh, Del Mar. Del Mar is the street that's kind of the line and St. Louis is kind of divides North St. Louis from, from Plus, not North St. Louis, I guess, like a better term, but Del, but Del Mar um, Avenue is one of the big streets in, in St. Louis. And so, the last about ten years, some of my daughter has a friend lives over there. But they've done a lot of a lot of redevelopment along Del Mar, and they put a lot of housing, new housing, and even and it's still a predominantly black neighborhood. But but a lot of the people said, "Oh, we don't want what happened on Del Mar to happen in Wells Goodfellow." And I think what the concern about it is 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 it's saying it's gentrification, it's, it's, it's housing. I think housing prices, they build new housing, become more expensive, that kind of thing. So that showed up a lot. They didn't really didn't come up that much. And so I think a lot of it's kind of place specific. And also I think it's the kind of stuff they're proposing. In Baden, most of the projects, they bought in Baden, uh, MSD, bought a lot of houses and tore them down. So that's where they had a lot of problems with stormwater and with combined sewer overflows and all that stuff. So they just bought houses paid people, tore down the houses and put in the, st the structure there. And they said that most people actually liked that because they felt, you know, the residents got paid. They, they uh, the people who wanted to, you know, they, they, the people whose houses basically were really in bad shape because of flooding were able to get, make money, were able to make some money and at least get, you know, and, and find new housing. And the projects were more of that scale. They were like individual lot scale. And so I think that was a lot more, and it didn't really raise that, that threat because your projects are kind of embedded in the neighborhood and you had to kind of go way back in to see where they are and that, that kind of stuff. But in, um, in Wells Goodfellow, um, you know, it's whole areas where they're doing this stuff. So I think it's a lot more, it's just a lot more dramatic. I think one of the things that I've really noticed from um, differences from LA is that we don't have as much vacant space because yeah. housing is and housing here is um you know it's such a such an issue and so when you showed that slide with you know the one it reminded me more of baltimore um yeah, exactly. or even detroit where you have like the one house on a house a block that used to be you know dozens um and so i you know when i look at that and i'm sure when the green coalition looks at that they see it as an opportunity um, and we've talked about it in class as an opportunity. Um, one of the examples that we talked about was in Detroit, there's a um, agri, agri, agriculture neighborhoods, they call them agrihoods, right? So like the whole neighborhood is becoming focused on that. Um, and I'm wondering if there have been discussions around, you know, rather than maybe the rendering that you showed, um, some ways to really almost just recreate neighborhoods with that vast amount of open space. They have been. There are a couple things going on, and and I think that are pretty that are pretty relevant. One is, um, so they are so just kind of east of there. Um, 
there's a big project, the city, so, so Defense Mapping Agency, which doesn't call this anymore, but Defense Mapping Agency does all the GIS work and that kind of stuff for the, basically defense and for the Department of Defense. And they're in St. Louis and they were threatening to leave. And so they worked out to with the city to build this new campus. So their campus has got to be north of, uh, it's kind of north of downtown and it would be, and uh, so it's in North, North City. And so there's a lot of planning around that, around building new housing and a lot of things in there in areas which probably, which um, um, in that neighborhood. And so I think that there's a lot of speculation about, you know, maybe this will, some of this new development will spread. So I think there is interest in that. One of the big things they've talked about too, um, they had some pretty ambitious plans for doing like uh, kind of uh, energy gardens where they're doing these fast growing trees and doing that. And that was one plan which actually started and then kind of didn't kind of fizzled out. But they have been some pretty ambitious, ambitious. There's a lot of interest on in community gardening. gardening. Uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey is from East St. Louis and she has a foundation that's doing, she was in the Olympics, those of you I realize that not everybody, but she was in the Olympics uh, in the eighties and is from East St. Louis. And uh, her foundation does a lot with gardening. And so I think they're doing some stuff up there. So there's quite a bit, quite a bit going on. I think Catherine had, had a question. Hi, um, it sounds like I'm the only one who's like not in one specific class. Um, I'm here with another class and I don't know anything about wildlife or animals. Um, but I did just, it was super fascinating. So I had a question um, and you kind of someone answered it, but I thought it was really interesting how you talked about um, the fact that there are certain animals like raccoons, you know, that that the community there doesn't want to see like coming out of abandoned houses and things like that. And, and there is this loss of like the feeling of home that people felt and the feeling of community that, that people felt years and years and years ago. Um, do you think that there's a way to kind of incorporate specific wildlife that people want to see, you know, and, and like you said, community gardens and having those open spaces be utilized in a way that brings in specific wildlife that is more positive and kind of strays away from the wildlife that people don't want to see? Do you think that's possible or do you think that that would um, just perpetuate, not, not necessarily like perpetuate, but like, do you think that there's a way to have that without having the unwanted wildlife, I guess? Yeah, I think I there is. I think there, I think real quickly, I think what a lot of people responded to were the vacant lots. You know, I think a lot of what, the, I think a lot of what the issue is with all this is, is that people are really, especially Wells Goodfellow, because you saw that map. I mean, people are really upset about that. And they're really upset about the idea of the city kind of abandoning them. So mm -hmm. I think what, what happened is, is that, you know, when people talk about what they'd like to see, I think what they kind of felt was, and there, there are a bunch of programs the city has so they, to, to manage vacant lots. So I think what the city kind of, I think what the bottom line is for a lot of people is they would clean up the lots between people's houses. You know, so like if you're next door to your house, you don't have like, you know, four foot high grass and never get smoke. Okay, they can take care of that and take care of the sort of wildlife associated with those kinds of spaces that people actually are pretty good with some of the other places. You know, they say, you know, yeah, maybe the scale's a little big, but we're okay with the general concept of wanting to make them like community, because people like community gardens. Right. The, the idea of the parks, all those kinds of things, they're good with that. But I think they're just worried about, you know, the, um, but I think it's more that, that location and the scale are the two big questions. Because oh. I don't think people have anything really hugely against raccoons or anything. Right, like, right, of course, of course. Or that, like, yeah, coyotes, I think they do. And yeah, like, yeah, more, more like, yeah. Yeah. Other yeah. dangerous animals like that, yeah. But, okay, that's interesting, yeah. I was just, you know, curious, like, in what ways, obviously, you know, it sounds like that's something that's doable, but it's, you also answered right before me, you know, kind of more specifically in what ways, you know, community gardens could be implemented and stuff like that. So, sounds cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we're at five o'clock. Um, so thank you again so much um, for such oh, an interesting you. and just covering so many topics. Um, I was thrilled to, to hear it and, and to finally get to hear you speak, actually. Oh, thank you. That's great. <laughs> um, to everyone else, thank you so much for coming. We have a, uh, our next lecture is, um, is on our, our website and is, I think it's the 18th. Um, on environmental justice and public health with uh, someone from LMU, Dr. Peter Rej. 
So we'll look forward to that. And thank you for being our second speaker in our spring lecture series. Charlie, thank you so much. Eric, thank you. It was great seeing you again. And it was always not, I'm not sure if you remember, but it was nice seeing you again. It was nice you. to meet you or see you again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Take oh, care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, great. Thank you. Good night.